ंग द process of a plastic anemia just the oral idea is largely either idiopathic or uh, secondary to <coughs> drugs or toxins no no but can you all hear me well because i'm using my hands free or headset is my voice clear enough okay so uh, what, what what is aplastic anemia that is a bone marrow failure due to fatty infiltration of the bone so bone marrow failure can occur due to other reasons like similarity in b12 deficiency can cause a pancytopenia maybe but to call it aplastic anemia we should so show that the marrow is merely a cellular and the tissue space is replaced with what of fat tissue a beetle deficiency i don't think we can consider it causes a plastic anemia or the causes and cytopenia chronic liver disease again can cause pan cytopenia either due to hypersplenism or even to some extent marrow failure but still it's not a classic cause of a plastic anemia myelofibrosis uh ट्रांसफॉर्मिंग scenario here mm. and same with itp fanconi anemia is of course the well known uh, genetic cause is one uh, is one of the probably the main genetic etiology for aplastic anemia so the causes of aplastic anemia are like mclaughlin davidson or even if you look up in hofstra and essential hematology apparently they go whatever that is uh we look at the causes you can find few things and remember them okay now the next question is typical features or associations of spondyloarthritis so what is spondyloarthritis oh, sorry any any questions or any alternative answers to previous question number 13 okay typical features of associations of spondyloarthritis so spondyloarthritis spon spon refers to spine so uh, arthritis affecting the axial skeleton now in other words the spine are called spondyloarthritis arthritis in the plural term 
<coughs> so these are associated with a set of extra axial skeletal as well as non skeletal manifestations so probably need to know a few of them uh, i think there were 10 9 or 10 a's that we used to memorize this is starting from anterior viitis in the eyes and then you one can get apical fibrosis of lungs and then you can get aortic root dilatation or Can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Right. I think you all can hear me, can't you? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Sorry about that. So, uh, anterior VITs, apical fibrosis of lungs, aortic root dilatation, we can call it aortitis, aortic irritation, certain arrhythmias, these are large reduced heart blocks, right? Then you can get amyloidosis, going further down to liver spleen level, if you imagine it as a cause of organomegaly. Then you can get arthritis of large joints like knee joint characteristically. Then uh, Achilles tendinitis, right? So these are some of the classic extra actual skeletal and non-skeletal manifestations of uh, <coughs> spondyloarthritis. Oh, this was, there's another thing called arachnoid, spinal arachnoiditis. Spinal uh, now, <clears throat> let's have a look at these answers. So, heel lenticitis is true. Sacroiditis is, of course, true because it's, 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 an, it's, a, it's an actual skeletal manifestation. Palatal ulcers, I don't think this is a classic feature. This is more likely to occur with something like SLE. Right? Anterior VITs is true. Uh, Reynolds phenomenon again, it's more it's either primary or secondary to more connective tissue disease like systemic sclerosis or sometimes SLE, much less connective. Okay, any different thoughts? Right, no different thoughts. Fine. <clears throat> right, I'll, I'll leave it like that for the moment. Probably, I think there was another question on arthritis later on. At that point, I'll come back to variation of back pain, red flags, and a few other things around back pain. Okay, fine. Let's go on to the question number 15. Regarding bacterial meningitis, antibiotics should not be started before lumbar puncture. Is that true or false? So, I mean, it's ideal if you can do the lumbar puncture and particularly the example for culture, but if the patient is unstable and unwell, and if the circumstances are such that you can't do the lumbar puncture urgently, then you will always start antibiotics after taking a blood culture. Okay, so this I should mark false. Antibiotics should not be started before lumbar puncture. I will mark it false. Hemophilus influence infection is associated with hearing loss. Is that true or false? 
can take it through it's it's typically seen with streptococcus pneumoni but it is also seen with hib and uh, meningococcal uh, the numbers are becoming less and less largely because of successful vaccination against hib and reduced uh, number of cases of hib meningitis but in the past hib did cause sensory neural deafness as a complication of meningitis, so that can be marked through. Presence of mercury papillary ash is suggestive of meningococcal infection. Is that correct? So that's, I'm going to mark false because meningococci may typically cause a petechial or purpuric rash. Simple. So that's because of bleeding under the skin. So petechia and purpura are bleeding under the skin. Whereas macula with or without papula is because of local inflammation that causes color change. Macula is impalpable, papula is palpable. IV dexamethasone improves clinical outcome. Which clinical outcome does it improve? Am I, am, I, am I going too fast? You are lazy, neither. Which clinical outcome does it improve? I'm sure all of you know that it's, it's the hearing loss that is well known to improve as a clinical outcome. Hydrocephalus is a complication, yes. Can be communicating or non-communicating. Communicating kilaki and arachnoid level the key, uh exudation the kehinga, reabsorption amarula, CSF accumulate la pressure media nika. Communicating the non-communicating and not an obstructive kiyama for a minute of mush kind majindi block villa. Intracranial pressure, where do you think? Neither. Okay, so whichever the way, hydrocephalus, yes, it is a known complication. Okay. Any other questions related to this one? Yes, so meningococcal meningitis, it is a purpury crash. You are correct. So this has to be marked false. See, presence of macular papular rash is suggestive of meningococcal infection is false. I'm sorry if I said yes. I'm sorry if I said true. It is a purple crash. Uh, Dexamethasone improves clinical outcome true, and it is a sensory neural deafness that it prevents, or at least reduce. Hydrocephalus is a complication. Yes, that is true. So, one of the other aspects that can be commonly questioned in, in relation to CNS infections are interpreting the CSF uh, findings. I found it useful to identify a CSF analysis as a viral pattern or bacterial pattern or PB pattern. Viral pattern is a mild increase in protein, so usually the upper limit is 4 to 5. So this is something around upper 40s, 50s, maximum maybe 60s. Sugar is normal in relation to blood sugar, it's more than two thirds, and it's lymphocytic, so that's the viral pattern. Bacterial pattern is high protein, 60, 70, 80. Sugar is less than two thirds, or sometimes even less than half of blood sugar and it is predominantly neutrophil. PB pattern is very high protein, usually three figures, and sugars are very low, and it's classically lymphocytic. In very early stages, you might catch, or you might find it neutrophilic, but most of the time, by the time patient presents, it's lymphocytic. So, apart from viral infections, there are other reasons for one to have a viral pattern CSF, and those are partially with bacterial meningitis, 
and aseptic meningitis. There are a few other things, but I don't think you need to worry about them. Just try to remember the yellow highlights. Similarly, you can see bacterial pattern in Toxoplasma brucella. Okay, that's fine. Just remember, Listeria, although it is, back, uh, it is a bacterium, you can find sometimes it's large to neutrophilic, while sometimes it's large to lymphocytic. Okay, so if you find high protein, low sugar, then you are seriously thinking of bacterial. So if it shows lymphocytic, don't get carried away, think of Listeria as the possible cause. And you will find the TP pattern also with fungal meningitis and brucella. Okay, any questions? No questions. Very nice. Regarding leptospirosis, next stiffness is a clinical feature. How do you do that? So next stiffness is a feature of meningeal irritation. So it's the subarachnoid hemorrhage or meningitis. Does leptospirosis cause meningitis? Yes, it does. And what what type of meningitis does it cause? It's an aseptic meningitis. Or so in other words, even with active meningitis, if you do a CSF, you will not find leptospira in the CSF. It's a sterile CSF, but it is inflamed because of an immune response. Right. Conjunctival suffusion is a feature. What's the difference between conjunctival suffusion, injection, and hemorrhage? Or oh, let me call it subconjunctival hemorrhage. Conjunctival suffusion kiani. It's it's the manifestation of conjunctival inflammation where it is more a more homogeneous redness in an area in the conjunctival. Whereas conjunctival injection is a manifestation of just hyperemia. In other words, it's just prominent vascular markings on the conjunctival. Suffusion is more diffuse, a, a bit more homogeneous redness. And subconjunctival hemorrhage is a very well defined PO red area, which is very easy to pick. Okay, and what are the uh, what are the ocular manifestations or ocular signs of leptospirosis? The the more path more pathognomonic or more classic feature of classic eye sign of leptospirosis is conjunctival suffusion. Okay, injection can happen with many other reasons, but suffusion is more or less. So in other words, people say if you have a patient with acute fever and he has conjunctival suffusion and myalgia, that that collection of symptoms is pathognomonic of leptospirosis. And if you only look at the eye, and if you find suffusion with jaundice, it is very likely to be leptospirosis. Okay. So <clears throat> the eye signs of Leptospirosis would be conjunctival suffusion, conjunctival injection, subconjunctival hemorrhages, and joints. Harine, or it became classic mechatomy suffusion. An active urinary sediment is a common feature. Well, I mean, yeah, you can call it a common feature, but what do you understand by the term active urinary sediment? So this actually doesn't have a very precise definition. Generally, we say if there are red cells, red cell casts, and pus cells, that is an active sediment. But in practice, most of the time, if you have, or if the patient has red cell casts, or at least there is microscopic hematuria, in other words, if you find red cells in the UFR, then you start thinking this is an active sediment. Okay. And what is the classic UFR or classic urine full report in leptospirosis? It is pus cells, red cells, and bile. And 
cell class as well. A sales class which says by uh, is the classic UFRL leptose biogenesis. Disproportionate increase in serum urea than that of creatinine is common. They can add to the mama than the Google than the him. Oh, any guesses? <coughs> so you would see uh, uh, disproportionately high urea than creatinine in an AKI if the AKI is due to dehydration. Okay. And in leptospirosis, dehydration is one of the contributory factors for AKI. You would also see a disproportionately high creatinine in the setting of AKI if there is ongoing muscle injury. Okay. So, uh, lepto does cause myositis. So, I, I don't know which which direction to take. So I would probably leave this without marking it, unless one of you can help me to sort this out. Okay, no answer. So let's leave it unmarked, okay? Any other questions? No questions. Okay. Regarding inheritance of genetic disorders, Huntington Korea is an example of trinucleotide repeat. Uh, yeah, it's, the better word would be trinucleotide repeat expansion, neither, rather than mutation. So mutation is a, it's a change in a point. It's better to call it a trinucleotide repeat expansion. So, is this correct? Yes. So, that is true. Mothers with autosomal dominant disease transmit the disease to 25% of their offspring. Take a if we are told that someone has an autosomal dominant disease, we, we would consider that he the, the index case has one abnormal gene and one normal gene. Okay. We do not consider the possibility of that individual having two abnormal genes. Okay. Now in this scenario, if one of the uh, chromosomes in the mother has the disease disease causing gene. Probability is that half of uh, offspring will get it, so the the percentage will be fifty percent. You know, I think they see one it's all right. Males are not carriers in excellent recessive diseases. Now, generally, in this. This type of questions, we are considering diseases which are of Mendelian inheritance. We do not pay too much attention on, say, things like uh, incomplete penetration, uh, right? What about having uh, uh, less severe mutation, which is subclinical and eva eva right? So if um, if the disease is excellent recessive, the male will invariably manifest the disease because he has only one X chromosome. So he will be a diseased individual. So this is true. Males are not carriers in excellent recessive disease. 
mitochondrial diseases are inherited from the paternal side එක දන්නවා නේ මේ වෙන්නේ නැහැ නේ paternal side එකෙන් එන එන nucleus එක විතරයි නේ ඕවම් එකෙන් මේ සයිටොප්ලස්ම් එක ඒක තියෙන mitochondria එන්නේ fetus එකට so all the mitochondrial diseases are maternally inherited any questions no questions right <coughs> skipping generations is a feature of autosomal recessive inheritance true or false um questions so uh ek hari ne the For the autosomal recessive case, uh, you need two mutated or abnormal genes to come together. So, in at one level of generation, it might not happen. It can happen in the other, in the next generation. In contrast, a, if there is skipping of generations, you can exclude autosomal dominant inheritance. Correct. in most of the scenarios that are relevant for you okay right now generally uh, i i don't think it's common for you all to get a pedigree chart and then to interpret the type of inheritance but sometimes sometimes this has been asked if i'm not mistaken so i have i i think i had a very right so this is a fairly simplified structure that i use i try to answer the question in a sequence i first ask could this be y linked inheritance is it mitochondrial inheritance is it x linked inheritance or is there genomic imprinting and then if there if none of these are there then it's either autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive okay so the first thing i would look at in a pedigree chart is to see does it affect both men and women if only men are affected then it's a it's like to be a y linked disease okay and then i confirm it by looking at the male offspring of men all of them will be affected okay then it is a wiling inheritance then i ask the question so if it is not wiling then is it mitochondrial that's very easy you will find that only women transmitted and she would transmit it to all of her children they are straight with the common atan then could it be exling so the give uh, or the catch here is affected men's sons are not affected because men uh, with the disease will be having the disease because of abnormal x and if he has a son he would have given his y to the son and not the x so there can't be any man who has given the disease to any of his male offspring Okay. Then to differentiate between recessive and dominant, I look at other things like uh, skipping generations. I don't think you need to worry about genomic imprinting. Okay, so you can leave it for the moment. And if if the, <coughs> if the pattern is not of any of these, then it's either autosomal dominant. no skipping of generations or autosomal recessive where there is skipping of generations okay variable penetrance again probably not to worry too much about okay fine uh oh there is one slide missing anyway so the other thing so uh, 
the other set of questions that you will be asked is the type of inheritance and the disease. So there are a whole heap of diseases. You cannot remember all of them. It's probably worthwhile remembering maybe about three or four common diseases under each category. So if they are there, you know it. If whatever that is there, you don't know, just leave it. I'm sure you will have notes on common autosomal dominant recessive XL, RXL, D, and mitochondrial diseases. Okay. Any questions? Or tell me if I'm too fast. No questions. Okay. Okay. In the next area, we will be able to Right, come on. Hormones that are increased in stressful situations. Oh, Hormones that increase in stressful situations are cortisol, thyroxine, ready when you are there. Man. Thyroxine uh, is a hormone that maintains basal metabolism and things like that. When you are stressed out, you need to transfer your energy to the fight and flight response. So in fact, in acute stressors, you might find a bit of suppression of hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. And that is what you see in sickly thyroidism, for example, during an acute illness. Okay, I suppose that's not a question. Hari, insulin, because insulin is an anabolic hormone, it will push glucose out of blood into more storage tissues like <coughs> liver and adipose tissue and skeletal muscle. But what you need during stressful situations is to have a lot of glucose concentrating in your skeletal muscles, insulin will actually be suppressed or glucagon to insulin ratio will go up. So there is more sugar in the blood circulation so that it can be taken up into skeletal muscles through insulin independent blood GLUT4 channels. Insulin at the Prolactin, well, I suppose... Uh, it's good enough to know that prolactin is increased. Exact reasons are not very clear. Maybe it has some supportive role for other stress hormones. Uh, so it, it, it does go up. Right? So we cannot explain that rise from the usual functions of prolactin. But it does go up. Growth hormone, we know it is a stress hormone. So that will also go up. So cortisol, growth hormone, prolactin, and of course, uh, the sympathetic hormones like adrenaline, noradrenaline will go up, while thyroxine insulin will be suppressed. Yes, sorry. The other thing is that the question is that the other thing is that the other thing is that the other thing is that the other Hormones that increase in stressful situations are cortisol, hurry, thyroxine, vadavi, insulin, adivinoa, prolactin, vadivinoa, growth hormone, vadivinoa. Okay. Nikaharita, any questions? No questions. Regarding the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, this is a very common area where questions are asked. So it's good if you can remember the physiology of uh, RAS. Renin secretion is induced by <coughs> atrial natriuretic peptide. <coughs> Sorry, look at that. Then renin system, what's the ultimate function of RAM activation? to cause fluid retention and increase blood pressure. Okay. Then what's the action of atrial natriuretic peptide? 
function of atrial natrio peptide is natriuresis. Okay. So that will happen when the intravascular volume is full or expand. Okay. Now, uh, when will the renin secretion go up? That's when the intravascular volume is depleted. So if the ANP is up and is trying to deplete the intravascular volume by causing natriuresis, does it make sense for ANP to go and activate renin secretion? Probably does not, right? Okay. So in fact, ANP inhibits renin secretion. The mevagadeval uhuma hitala makaradakatika tricky. Sometimes there are unexplained associations, so unexplained mechanisms, so secondarily mediated mechanisms. So for those reasons, I would suggest for physiology questions, if you know it, mark it. If you don't know it, leave. Okay, so there's a very good question uh, put up in the chat. I, I will go back to that. When cortisol is high, since there is high glucose in blood, why not insulin will increase to lower that blood glucose level? Okay, so <clears throat> what you need to realize here is uh, glucose is not the only stimulus for beta cells to release insulin okay it is also under the influence of beta adrenergic stimulation and various other things at the time of stress body's physiological mechanisms are operating to increase blood sugar so cortisol will, will do that by causing a degree of insulin resistance the other hormones will also have a direct effect on beta cells to prevent it from increasing insulin release in response to this rising glucose. Okay, so this is a situation where even the blood sugar is high, insulin level is suppressed. Okay, and that's an, uh, the reason is there are other factors influencing beta cell function. I hope that's clear enough. But that's a very good question. Fine. So let's come back to the renin aldo question. So uh, ANP is actually inhibiting renin secretion. So that's just a fact, which does make sense. Uh, so uh, so that's it. So we can we have to mark this one for us. Angiotensin two is produced in the liver. Ekavaradin liver uh, angiotensinogen is produced in the liver. It is converted to angiotensin one. And then it is converted to angiotensin 2 predominantly in the pulmonary capillary. Let's say inside the lungs. Angiotensin 2 stimulates ADH release from the hypothalamus. So what's the, so again, going back to what RAM activation is trying to do, it is trying to retain water from the kidneys and expand the intravascular volume. What's the role of ADH? It's anti-diuresis. So it's pre again preventing diuresis and retaining water. So it makes sense for angiotensin 2 to stimulate ADH release. And if you remember it from uh, physiology, yes, this is one of the 405 actions of angiotensin 2. Is it correct to say it is from hypothalamus? Well, yes, because it's hypothalamus and pituitary uh, is pretty much a single unit when it comes to ADH release. So if someone says ADH release from hypothalamus, that is correct. If someone says ADH release from posterior pituitary, that's also correct. But if some, someone says ADH release from anterior pituitary, that is false. Hurry. Aldosterone acts on the distal convoluted tibial. Uh, 
I think you can take it true. Predominant side affection is probably the collecting ducts, but there are some aldosterone receptors even in the distal convoluted tubules, so that's fine. We can mark it true. But if the statement said aldosterone predominantly acts on distal convoluted tubule, that will be false. Activation of RAM is beneficial in chronic heart failure. Well, we know this is a maladaptive strategy. In chronic heart failure, people are ID matters. They have expanded extravascular volume as well as intravascular volume because of back pressure in the venous system, while their arterial system is relatively underfilled and kidneys are relatively underperfused. So, this underperfusion of the kidneys activate RAM. Uh, although it, 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 ha it, it should have a, I mean, it makes sense if the kidneys are underperfused, kidneys think the intravascular volume is depleted, but in reality, it's only the arterial side that is relatively insufficient, while the venous side is congested. And this fluid retention, therefore, can worsen edema. And in, 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 in the long run, the aldosterone has negative effects on myocardial remodeling that worsens heart failure. So therefore, we know RAM activation is a maladaptive response in heart failure. And that's the reason we block the system using AS inhibitors, ARVs, ARNI, or MRA. So mineral oil group is antagonist uh, in the treatment of chronic heart failure. Any questions there? Right. So that's fine. So this is just from Google, so nothing dramatic here. So angiotensin 2, well, it's told to have a permissive effect or a sympathetic activating effect. Its main effect is on the tubulous sodium reabsorption, uh, and which also follows water reabsorption. So that's a direct effect of angiotensin. In addition, angiotensin can also stimulate release of aldosterone from adrenal cortex, zona glomerulosa, and this aldosterone can also cause sodium and water retention. Angiotensin 2 also has a vasoconstrictor effect on arterioles, thereby causing a rise in blood pressure. And this is the effect on posterior pituitary slash hypothalamus increasing ADH secretion. Okay. Right. Now, <clears throat> I also wanted to touch on this. This is another aspect that can be questioned in MCQs, particularly in the evaluation of secondary hypertension or young hypertension or Resistant hypertension, we, we investigate for hyperaldosteronism. Okay, now what do you mean by hyperaldosteronism? It is the clinical phenotype of hypertension, hypokalemia, and what else? Alkalosis. Alkalosis. So why do all these things happen? When there is aldosterone excess, it activates the inex uh, sorry, uh, it activates the aldosterone uh, receptors causing sodium retention and water retention, which causes hypertension. When sodium reabsorption is increased, in the distal convoluted tubule and collecting ducts, in compensation, potassium and H plus are excreted into urine. So, therefore, there is alkalosis and hypokalemia. So, if someone has this hyperaldosteronism phenotype, then we investigate them to see if they actually have too much aldosterone levels in blood. How do we do that? We do what is called aldosterone to Renin ratio in blood. Okay. Right. And then we can find three outcomes. One is one might have low renin 
and high aldo o1 might have high renin and high aldo o1 might have low renin and low aldo despite having the hyperaldosteronism phenotype ay e tika therunada any questions up to this point okay no questions so what are the causes for uh, low renin high aldo in other words if you look at this cycle okay i don't have renin here so uh, if there is too much aldosterone it will have a negative feedback effect on renin secretion so if you find suppressed renin and high aldo that is a true scenario of primary hyperaldosteronism okay so this is primary hyperaldosteronism which can be due to bilateral adrenal hyperplasia or an adrenal adenoma which is called con syndrome it can rarely be adrenal carcinoma let's say adrenal cancer and there is one other cause which i don't think you need to remember someone is interested it is glucocorticoid remediable hyperaldosterone right so that is low renin high aldo if someone has high renin high aldo then it is a primary hyperaldosterone for us to call it primary hyperaldo there should be a source of aldosterone secretion which is out of the ram control But if someone is having having high renin and high aldo, that means the high renin is the primary problem, which is driving the high aldosteronism. We can call this secondary hyperaldosteronism. So, what are the causes of secondary hyperaldosteronism? Hello, my classic causes: renal artery stenosis. Hello. the other more rare cause is renin secreting tumor of the kidney which we call renin okay. we also see high uh, or secondary hyperaldosteronism in hypovolemic states okay which includes nephrotic okay syndrome okay cirrhosis and even chronic heart failure okay but these are not clinical scenarios where we can this worry about hyperaldosteronism phenotype okay say for example if we investigate someone for resistant hypertension with hypokalemia and alkalosis but is resistant hypertension and hypokalemia for example and if you find high renin and high aldo you're not going to think about nephrotic syndrome cirrhosis heart failure etc because they do not actually present with hypertension and hypokalemia they will have their own clinical manifestations there are any dekhiye na okay now finally the funny entity you have the hyperaldosteronism phenotype uncontrolled hypertension hypokalemia but you find actually the aldosterone level is low and even the renin level is low in other words the entire renin aldosterone system is suppressed but the clinical phenotype is of high aldosterone so what is that can someone give me one or two causes of low renin low aldo causing hyperaldo phenotype hello boy so treatment with hydrocortisone right so that's a good thought so <laughs> if the treatment of hydrocortisone is for adrenal insufficiency then we are giving a physiological dose hari but as you said if it is a therapeutic treatment okay then 
in a sense. What are you referring to here? Cushing syndrome, isn't it? Lemonade. Cortisol lexis, either endogenous or exogenous. That's absolutely correct. So Cushing syndrome is one of the causes of hyperaldophenotype with low renin, low alpha, or hyperaldophenotype with suppressed RAC. A Cushing syndrome will hyperaldophenotype again. Can cortisol activate neurocorticoid receptor? Yes. In fact, cortisol has a greater affinity to mineralocorticoid receptor than aldosterone. Okay. I will come to that again in the next slide. Okay. Got it. Cushing. So there could be other cortisol or related glucocorticoids that activate the aldosterone receptor. And this typically we see in adrenocortical cancers that secreting, that secrete other metabolites. Classic one is called do deoxycortisol. Okay. So doc secreting tumors, some people call it doc omas. Okay. Right. Now, anything else? Has anyone heard of Little Syndrome? Then aldosterone, once it binds to the aldosterone receptor, how does it bring about its action? That is by increasing the expression of epithelial sodium channels or INAX. Now, Little Syndrome is a genetic disease where INAC is hyperactive. Okay, so if the inner case active, even in the absence of aldosterone, what it does is it causes sodium reabsorption, which is followed by water reabsorption, and in exchange of sodium reabsorption, there will be loss of or secretion of potassium and H plus into urine, thus causing the hyperaldosteronism phenotype. Because essentially, Inac channel is what brings about the effects of aldosterone, and if the inac is active without aldosterone, then it will produce the aldosterone phenotype. And these effects of high blood pressure, low potassium, and all that <coughs> will feed back on the RAM and suppress the RAM or RAS system. So they will have low renin, low aldo, but they will also have the hyperaldo phenotype. Okay. Good. Um, I'm sure you all have heard of apparent mineralocorticoid excess, at least in physiology. This can appear every now and then yeah. in, in final year MCQs. Now, this is what I told you. Aldosterone acts on the aldosterone receptor or the mineralocorticoid receptor. Okay. Cortisol has a strong affinity to mineralocorticoid receptor, but in healthy individuals at the renal tubules, cortisol is rapidly inactivated to cortisol by the sensor. Eleven hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, is what we don't worry about that. Now, in some people, so 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 in Cushing syndrome, what happens is cortisol is there in so much abundance that it overcomes the capacity of this enzyme so that there is enough cortisol to go and activate the mineral cortical receptor. Okay, my Cushing syndrome is the way. Now, in some individuals, due to a genetic mutation, this hormone is dysfunctional. Cortisol is not being inactivated to cortisol at the renal tubules, 
So this will go and activate the mineral of corticoid receptor. It will cause high blood pressure and low potassium. That will inhibit the RAM system. So there is low renin, low aldo, but hyperaldophenol. Now that is called apparent mineral low corticoid excess. Okay. Now this can happen due to the genetic mutation, but the other classic MCQ question is licorice ingestion. Licorice is a sweet, no, I think it's, I don't think that's available in Sri Lanka, but it is available in Western countries. If someone is using a lot of licorice, then this licorice will go and inhibit this enzyme. So the cortisol will accumulate causing apparent mineral cortified excess. Right. Now, final thing to remember is <clears throat> if someone has adrenal adenoma or adrenal carcinoma, okay, then you would treat them with surgery. Remove the tumor. If someone has bilateral adrenal disease, then you're not going to take off both adrenals. Instead, you will treat them medically by blocking the aldosterone receptor. Okay? If someone has secondary hyperaldosteronism, then you are going to treat them. Renal artery stenosis, well, you can either manage medically or you can do renal artery stenting. Okay? Or something like that. Reninoma, you will remove it by surgery. In the scenario of low renin, low hyperaldosteronism, Cushing's, you will find the cause for Cushing and treat it. Adrenal cancer, you will operate it. Little syndrome. How are you going to treat little syndrome? Is it good enough to block the aldosterone receptor? by a mineral or corticoid receptor antagonist like spironolactone. Will that work here? Man, it is. Because then in little syndrome, the problem is at the next step or the final step, overactivity of inactions. So if the problem was aldosterone hormone excess, then you can block the aldosterone receptor with spironolactone. But in little syndrome, the inec is continuously hyperactive, even without aldosterone. So in this case, you have to block the inec channel itself. Okay. Now how do you do that? What's the drug? Amyloride. Name. This is also a, a reasonably common MCQ. <clears throat> Middle syndrome is treated with spironolactone is false. Spironolactone or any other mineral corticoid antagonist like eplerenone, finrenone, and little syndrome. Amyloride. So you need to remember the physiology of renin aldosterone mechanism. Then you need to understand low renin uh, or hyper aldo phenotypes and how to investigate and manage. Okay, any questions? No questions. Last question. Thyroid diuretics resulting. Make a lace in any other. Thyroid diuretics act on the distal convoluted tubule to block sodium chloride channels. And then this 
delivers a large load of sodium to the collecting ducts. Okay. And, that, and then this causes a diuresis. So a large volume of sodium and water is going out in urine. At the same time, because of this high amount of sodium reaching the collecting ducts, some of that is reabsorbed in exchange of potassium and H plus. Okay, and when that happens, blood potassium levels go down and blood H plus level also goes down. And this causes an alkalosis. From a complex mechanism, Thiazide diuresis, thiazide diuretics will cause a calcium retention. Okay. Uh, don't ask me the mechanism. How I remember that is frozimide, which can or which was used for the treat, for treatment of hypercalcemia in the past, will cause calciuria. Or in other words, frozimide will put calcium into urine, while thiazide does the opposite. By causing calcium retention. Okay, and we also know thiazide is a classic cause of <coughs> hyponatremia by virtue of being a natriuretic agent. Uh, so the, there is more sodium loss than water, so effectively it can cause hyponatremia. And thiazide diuretics are much more likely than frusimide to cause hyponatremia. So, thiazide diuretics decrease so serum sodium years, increase serum potassium falls, it causes hypokalemia, reduce serum uric acid. We know it is false because we know thiazide diuretics classically can precipitate gout. That's why causing retention of uric acid. Uh, so, that's, that's false. Then, increase serum calcium. Yes. So, frusimide decreases serum calcium, thiazides increase serum calcium. Increase serum pH, yes, because when there is a lot of sodium delivered to collecting ducts, some of that is reabsorbed in exchange of potassium and H. So, losing H from serum causes it to become alkalotic. What genetic disease resembles metabolically? Thiazide effects and what genetic disease metabolically resembles frusimide effects? Uh, thiazide decay effects TNA, Gittelman syndrome, neither. Nevat, we cut in the light, MCQ, Nahalati, neither. So just remember, Gittelman syndrome is similar to HCT effect, whereas Barter syndromes are similar to Frosinide effects. Okay. Right. Okay. Shall we move on to single based response? <coughs> Any questions or do you all need a break? We have about uh, a little less than an hour left. Are you two hours in the plan, Kale? Yes, sir. Then Navatan no never again, Kian, eh? Man, sir, we have the Gadam Karang Yamni. Hurry, Nima. Fifty five year old woman presented with shoulder pain and weakness that increased towards the end of the day. The acetyl choline receptor antibodies were positive, and the EMG showed a reducing potential with repeated muscle contractions. What is the best treatment to improve her symptoms? Diagnosis, Sagamagadi? Hello. Hello, my esteem. My esteem. Any anything incompatible with myasthenia? Myasthenia will in muscle pain in a muscle hard marker pain in a Yeah, it is. It's a weakness. 
So I don't know why they have mentioned shoulder pain, but uh, I mean, if the antibodies are positive and EMG shows uh, reducing potentials, I have no doubt in the diagnosis of myasthenia, and therefore I will take it as myasthenia. If those were not there, then I start thinking of myositis, where immunomodulators uh, become important. Okay. Now, anything else that is not so typical of myasthenia here? Uh, generally, uh, acetylcholine receptor antibodies tend to be associated more with ocular myasthenia. There is no mention of eye signs or symptoms. And what do you mean by ocular myasthenia? Is when eyes are affected with or without generalized um, systemic component. Okay. But I don't think you need to worry about it. Generally, if ACH receptor antibodies is positive, that is myasthenia. And you have EMG evidence that is myasthenia. So you are talking about treating myasthenia. Is there any suggestion of a myasthenic crisis here? Respiratory failure, this is just simple, straightforward myasthenia graphs. Then what's the first line of treatment? Periodistic. How does it act? It blocks acetylcholine esterase, thereby it increases acetylcholine levels in the neuromuscular junction that produces uh, muscle symptoms or muscle weakness. Periodistic mean well in response cut methan at the maximum polarized dose, that is when you add steroids. Okay. So you then start at a higher dose of steroids, taper it off. If the symptoms relapse, you add a steroids pairing it. Okay. So whichever the way, unless there is a myasthenic crisis, you will start with periodistic. Any questions? So, IV methylprednisolone, IV IG, cyclophosphamide, myasthenic crisis, well, it never try chronically well, but not at this stage. And acetylopren is a steroid sparing agent that can be used later on. Yes, you need it. What's the other antibody that is associated with myasthenia? Anti-musk antibody, anti-muscle specific kinase. The product will become facial bulb Anti-musk antibody positive myasthenia. So if you suspect myasthenia, what are the what is the bedside test that you can do? So on clinical examination, we will try to demonstrate fatigue ability. That is the short case. We will try to do it. As a as a bed bedside test, you can do what is called ice pack test. Me, sir, lama at rest, degree of partial ptosis balana ma. It is called ice pack. It is called partial ptosis. So, we will try to do it. Okay. So, ice pack test is a bit side test. Then, lab tests are EMG for decremental action potentials with repeated simulation, acetylcholine receptor antibodies. Any other investigation that has to be done in all my clinics? All patients with myasthenia should have a CT chest done to look for thymoma. Oh, sorry. 
ಸರಿ ನಮ್ಮ ಯಾಕಂದ್ರೆ ನಿಮ್ ಸೂಟ್ ಹೇಳಿ any other questions no questions don't you have any questions okay next one 33 year old woman presented with severe left shoulder pain her it increased gradually during the initial 24 hours after onset pain occurred two weeks after being administered the influenza vaccine It's a dull pain for which she was given an LG6. There is a mild weakness in left shoulder movements. Reduced bicep jerk and reduced pinprick sensation in C5 and C6 gametes. What is the most likely diagnosis? Look at this one. Hello. So I can already feel a bit of transverse myelitis. It's fairly easy, isn't it? This is the classic presentation of brachial neuritis. Okay. Unilateral, pain predominant, dominantly proximal, around C5, with some degree of weakness. Okay. Over time, they can also develop pasting. Okay. Brachial neuritis also, although it is a plexus disease, has a predilection to affect the C5, C6 levels. Okay, it's both sensory motor, but general tend to be sensory to them. Now, can this be damage to the axillary nerve during intramuscular injection of the vaccine? But I'm not going to vaccine. I am the killer. At least for theoretical. Purposes. If it was in uh, accidental nerve damage, this should be this should not be happening two weeks after the injection. Maybe they will ever end up. Yeah. And if the biceps jerk is hard to remove, the hack nail biceps are going to supply for the nerve because accidental nerve is going to be there. Yeah. Cervical radiculopathy. Then the pulva. There is no reason for her to get cervical radiculopathy. She is fairly young. Okay. So we have to look at the order so for C5, C6 nerve roots. Uh, but in this context of having the vaccine two weeks ago and pain predominant, this is sound like cervical radicular. Syringomyelia tends to be bilateral and it's sensory loss, largely in C8, T1 region because that's the commonest site for syringomyelia. Okay. And motor motor deficits tend to occur a lot later after sensory symptoms and sensory loss is fairly in the advance. Herpes zoster related neuralgia, I mean, theoretically possible, but in the absence of a rash, and in this context, it's it's unlikely. Transverse myelitis can be any kind of any sensory level. In a, in a, Lowering weakness, the other hand, transverse myelitis here. Okay, fine. That's fairly easy. Any questions? No questions. 76-year-old lady with a history of ischemic heart disease presented following an embolic stroke. She complains of severe pain in the right side of the body. She describes it as a burning pain. What is the most likely site that is affected? Can you tell 
Hello. Did you hear me? Initially, there might be <coughs> a bit of sense that the tingling, numbness, this, this type of symptoms. Uh, but at least later on, or even from the outset, uh, classic manifestation is heavy body pain, okay? burning pain, contralateral sign. Okay? Classic of thalamic infarcts. Now, generally, what, what, what's the what's the key difference between a seizure or, or and and stroke? Most of the time, seizure is a positive event. Muscle contractions, abnormal sensory symptoms, while stroke is more of a loss of function weakness, loss of sensation. So this is one, one exception where stroke is causing a positive symptom, a gain of symptom, like abnormal sensation or burning pain. Okay. Right. So that's thalamus. Yeah. Now, what do you think about this statement? Embolic stroke. Embolic stroke commonly in the brain in the mono region. Cortical to subcortical. Very good. Cortical. The embolic strokes, they, the embolus originate either from atria, as in the case of atrial fibrillation. Okay. The, or it might be from the valve region, like in the case of endocarditis. It might be from the ventricle, if there is a ventricular aneurysm, for example. Or it might be from aortic arch atheroma, atherosclerosis, or carotid artery atheroma. Okay. So atherosclerotic plaques rupture, clots form, and they get embolized. Maybe. Now, emboli wouldn't travel in high resistant parts or high resistant vessels. They wouldn't go into vessels with acute bends or angles. Okay. If you look at the cerebral circulation, the, the, the carotid, the internal carotid, and the middle cerebral artery, they are all, a, that's, that's a single continuum of a large artery. So these arteries supply the cortical region. In contrast, the deeper structures, so subcortical region like internal capsule, thalamus, and all those parts, are supplied by what are called perforated branches, which are 90 degree branches going in uh, from the main internal carotid, so MCUs or whatever. So it's very unusual for an embolus to go and lodge in a perforate artery and cause an embolic stroke. Okay, it's not, I'm not saying it is impossible, but it's quite unusual. Okay. 
but for some reason, someone has decided to put the statement in bullet stroke here. I don't know if it was a mistake made when someone tried to recall this question. Uh, generally, generally, I would say thalamic strokes are more thrombotic, you know, thrombosis than in body. Okay. There are circumstances where embolic strokes can cause thalamic infarcts, but I don't think you need to worry about these. In general, your understanding should be if you see a cortical infarct, look for a source of embolus. If you see a subcortical infarct, look for atherosclerosis. Okay. In other words, look for diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, smoking, things like that. So, but if you see an, a cortical infarct, you're going to go behind atrial fibrillation screening, echocardiograms, transesophageal glucose, carotid artery. Carotid artery Doppler, actually, we do in both these uh, types because carotid artery atherosclerosis and narrowing can cause emboli. But this can also be a surrogate marker of generalized atherosclerosis and arteriolosclerosis of perforate arteries. So, if anyone has a uh, infarct, then we would do carotid and carotid doppler. Okay. The ekatheronagami, embolic and thrombotic, and its association with cortical and subcortical infarcts and how you focus your evaluation depending on the embolic or thrombotic nature of the infarct. Okay. It's similar for hemorrhagic strokes. If you see, uh, so what, what, what are the common causes of hemorrhagic strokes? What is the commonest cause for hemorrhagic stroke? Hypertension, Nail. Hypertension, Tiana Cote, Ugolante, has no chute chute aneurysms. They were had in a chute, perforate arteries. What do you call those aneurysms? Sharko, Bochard aneurysms. Sharko, Bochard aneurysms. They can be the cause of thrombosis because of turbulent flow, or they can rupture to cause hemorrhages. So that's why hypertensive hemorrhages are typically deep seated internal capsule, thalamus, brain stem, cerebellum. That's why you would see hypertensive hemorrhages. The other big group of hemorrhages are AV malformations. And they typically occur in the cortical regions. So if you see subcortical hemorrhages or brainstem hemorrhages, then it's likely secondary to hypertension. But if you see cortical hemorrhages, even if the patient is hypertensive, you're not going to say this is a hypertensive hemorrhage. You're going to investigate for AV malformations by doing CT angiograms or DSAs or whatever. So that's about embolic versus thrombotic. E langa ka meti ko gula danda wa. Ito ko matra piya kena yana. Total anterior circulation stroke kya na matra. Partial anterior circulation stroke, posterior circulation stroke, and lacuna stroke. Cortical versus subcortical. I have discussed. Uh, in defining total low partial anterior circulations, we refer to higher uh, functions. So there are few higher functions that are commonly asked in MBBS. Most of these, so this is a table of several higher functions, but focus on what is highlighted in yellow. As you can see, parietal lobe deficits are what are commonly questioned. Okay, so Gerstmann syndrome, which is characterized by a calculia, inability to inability to do calculations, finger agnosia, inability to recognize fingers, 
left right disorientation and agraphia that is if you draw something on their palm like a number and ask them to identify it without looking at it they won't be able to do it sorry so that is agraphasthesia okay that is agraphasthesia agraphia can work at there anything that is inability to draw not a matter of okay so focus on these ones ones in yellow highlights other things you actually know do class aphasia you know when he's aphasia you know it's temporal speech perseveration is repeated you can in the same term uh, occipital or prosopognosia is inability to recognize faces so these are the ones that are commonly asked you know the symptoms hari any questions yeah No questions. This is Hatar. 36-year-old woman who was in bereavement after losing her husband two weeks ago presented to the emergency with central chest pain. Troponins were elevated. ECG showed ST elevations in anterior leads. Transferacid echo showed apical hypokinesia with an ejection fraction of 40. Coronary angiogram was entirely normal. What is the most probable diagnosis? Look at the uttere. Can it be STEMI? Is there anything that is not compatible with STEMI? An entirely normal coronary angiogram. Very good. That's right. So, in a STEMI, you would expect to see a completely blocked artery. But keep in mind, uh, sometimes, even in STEMIs, due to spontaneous thrombolysis, you might not see a completely blocked artery. Uh, because the body's thrombolytic mechanisms might cause lysis of the thrombus. Sometimes it might be at least partially paid. But for someone to have an entirely normal conorangiogram without any evidence of atherosclerosis in the coronary vasculature, it's very unusual to be stable. Okay? And also bear in mind, this is 36-year-old woman, okay, young, not common to get atherosclerosis okay unless she has something like familial hypercholesterolemia or something like that okay so that is not very favorable for a diagnosis of acute stem okay pericarditis pericarditis is like a rejection fraction not well apical hypokinesia how can we have men and if the ST elevations localized when it when yeah, ST elevations will be will be fused across all the leads. Brugada syndrome, you would see ST elevations in V123, and you won't see a reduction in rejection fraction or apical hypokinesis. Aortic dissection. Aortic dissection uh, Aortic dissection making MIA can the pull one can get inferior MI. Very good, yes. If the aortic dissection is Stanford type A and if it extends down to cover the right coronary cusp, the right aortic cusp where the right coronary originates. And if that gets blocked, it can cause an inferior MI. Okay. Man, Kali, there was a few other uh, caveats or things to bear in mind if you see an inferior MI. Q1 MI. Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. So before you add to calculate, think of aortic dissection. Ask for very, very sudden onset 
maintain that radius to interscapular region and look for differences in pulse or blood pressure in two arms. If you have any doubt, do a CT out of them. Uh, and the other thing to bear in mind is with inferior MI, look for heart blocks, okay, and look for right ventricular failure. Okay. Talk about some more cardio my pet again. Kahala pain or? The kahala na ta the throat ke varadhi hinda mega ta gahan dhulu ar ne. So this is a result of sympathetic overactivity, classically seen with highly stressful situations. Uh, you can also see this with fewer chrome cytoma, although that does not technically meet the definition of Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, because if you look at Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, the, the last criterion is exclusion of fewer chrome cytoma and myocarditis. Okay? But you still see the same clinical syndrome in people with fewer chrome cytoma. Okay, so what you see is ST elevations to inversions. Troponins are not very high, okay, just a very subtle, modest increase in troponins. 2D echo will show apical ballooning. Now, what this means is classically, it's the apical region that becomes hypokinetic. Are you here, Wayne? So people say apex of the heart is where most beta receptors are found. So in other words, apical region of the left ventricle is the most beta receptor dense region. In conditions with very high adrenaline or epinephrine levels, or in supraphysiological epinephrine levels, as a paradoxical negative inotropic effect. So this will cause suppression of contractility of this apical region. So it becomes hypokinetic. While the other segments or the base of the heart remains hyperkinetic. So when the rest of the heart contracts forcefully or the rest of the left ventricle contracts forcefully, this sluggish or inactive apical segment will balloon out. This causes apical balloon. Uh, so that's what causes Takosubo cardiomyopathy or stress induced cardiomyopathy. This is this will resolve spontaneously in a few weeks. You should not be giving beta agonists like adrenaline or, or, or similar inotropes for these patients. In fact, the treatment is with beta blockers because the problem here is overactivity or overactivation of beta receptors. Any questions? No questions. Very good. Ah, thank you, <clears throat> Female on thyroxine presented with difficulty in breathing. She also complained of pleuritic type chest pain. On examination, she had an elevated JVP, and bilateral ankle edema, and clear lungs. Blood pressure was 70 by 50, low. ECG showed a narrow complex bradycardia, and chest x ray revealed cardiomegaly. Following investigations were also done. WBC normal, HB normal, platelets normal, TSH, TikTok ready, high, high, CRP is almost normal, creatinine normal, sodium normal, potassium normal. What is the most likely diagnosis? Congestive cardiac failure, myxedema, right heart failure, cardiac tamponade, pulmonary embolism. Before I answer that question, I forgot to mention something that is useful when you start doing the single risk response MCQs or SBR questions. 
Now, as you know, they do not carry negative marks, so somehow you have to answer all the questions. Never come without answering all the questions. Say, if you have 10 questions left to answer, but you only have 5 minutes, then what you're going to do is look at the questions where you have to read least. Keti prashtika balala eva yuttara maka. Antima vinadi yuttara tiyendi prashna kiyavana ganavatthala randomly ukarapu bodhi puja vabbata karavira kakkar yuttara kiyavana maka lai. Hari? So somehow mark all the questions. Yes, Mira. That's rule number one. Rule number two is Sometimes I find it useful to cover the answers and read the question. Okay. And think of the answer without looking at the question. And then if you find your answer in the list of answers, it is very likely that is the correct answer. Okay. Rule number three, even then, even if you find your answer in the list of answers, look at the other answers and justify to yourself why that answer is not correct and why your answer is correct. Okay? Because sometimes you might have missed one key uh, fact in the question and you might only find and we will, of the, the answers will of course have one response which matches uh, the answer if you know that particular fact. Okay. So even if you find that answer, you have to exclude or justify to yourself why the other answers are wrong. Okay. The maker anakote maker hituna. And I'm sure it would have been the same for you. Now, when that happens, we need to go one by one and say, justify to ourselves, okay, I'm going to exclude this answer for this reason. Very good. Okay. <coughs> Congestive cardiac failure. Okay. Is there anything that does not fit with this answer? Clear lungs. Very good. That's the number one reason why congestive cardiac failure is unlikely to be the correct answer. Okay. Any other reason? No, probably indirect. Now, if someone had congestive cardiac failure and the blood pressure is 70 by 50, what will be the heart rate response? Huh? Unless they are on a beta blocker, you would expect tachycardia because in response to hypotension, the sympathetic system will activate, okay, which will raise the heart. So I would not expect to see a bloody card. Okay. Everything else is competitive. Difficulty in breathing. Oh, pleuritic chest pain again is not compatible. Neither congestive heart failure to pleuritic chest pain in men. High JVP, ankle edema, low blood pressure, uh, narrow complex, cardiomegaly, normal blood, myocomatic compatible with congestive cardiac failure. Oh, good, okay. Exedema. Is there anything that is not compatible with mixity? Elevated JVP. Right. So uh, that's true. Okay. Um, mixedema will not directly cause elevated JVP. Okay. Right. Anything else? 
Sodium being normal. So, yes. So, in nixidema, if, if the hypothyroidism is severe enough, we often will expect the sodium to be low. But sometimes, you know, uh, it might not be very low. It's not a universal thing. Okay. So, you are very correct. I would have expected to see a lower sodium than this, but it does not necessarily exclude nixidema. Okay. Can nixidema cause a raised JVP? What are the cardiac manifestations of hypothyroidism? Yeah. Go. Heart failure, no other. The neck. So severe hypothyroidism can cause heart failure. Okay. And severe hypothyroidism can also cause pericardial effusions. Nearly. But if it is severe enough, it can cause tamponade and cause a IGP. Okay. Right. So, got uh, anything incompatible? Anything? Uh, anything else that is incompatible with myxedema? The Maki and a clinical picture. This looks like a severe hypothyroidism. Severe enough to cause probably cardiac tamponade rather than congestive cardiac failure because the lungs are clear, okay? And that severe hypothyroidism can also explain the bradycardia, okay? But I would not expect this to happen with a TFH of 6. Maybe. If this was 60, maybe yes, but... Uh, if someone is in cardiac tamponade due to hypothyroidism, I'm expecting to see a TSH in hundreds. Okay. So, uh, if this was 60, I would take it, but, but otherwise, I'm very reluctant to mark myxedema here. Right heart failure. Anything not compatible? Oh, sorry, but I don't know. A pleuritic chest pain can be found in the myxedema. It can cause pleural effusions. Yes, that's right. So uh, perhaps that might be the pleuritic chest pain they are referring to here. Now, pericardial or pericarditis. If there is some sort of inflammation of the pericardium. That can also give rise to a poor chest pain, but that pain is caused by the friction between inflamed parietal and visceral pericardium. Okay. But if someone has gone to an extent of developing a cardiac tamponade due to pericardial effusion, then there will be no friction between parietal and visceral layers. But at this stage, I will not be expecting to do just pain due to pericarditis. But as you said, due to pleural inflammation and pleural swellings, there might be poor chest pain. So that's fine. Right heart failure compatible with Nathimano Haruthena. Difficulty in breathing can happen because of underperfusion of the lungs and therefore decreased oxygenation. Okay. <clears throat> Pluritic chest pain and right heart failure. Better. 
in increase the ADP and edema, clear lungs, they are all fine. Low blood pressure, you know, the right heart failure will occur. Yes or no? Huh? Absolutely, yes. Right heart failure definitely can cause low blood pressure because the right heart is unable to pump blood to the left heart. So the left heart output is also low. Okay. Right. So their left ventricular ejection fraction will be normal. So left ventricle will pump out most of the blood that comes to the left ventricle. But the problem is not enough blood is coming to the left ventricle. Then again in right heart failure, I would expect to see a tachycardia rather than a bradycardia. Cardiomegal is possible with right heart enlargement. And the other things are also fine. Okay. So uh, pleuritic chest pain mainly incompatible feature and, 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 and also uh, bradycardia. Okay. That is not fitted. Okay. Cardiac tamponade. Again, uh, pleuritic chest pain is unexplained. These are explained. Low blood pressure is definitely yes. Bradycardia is very unusual. I would expect to see a tachycardia here. Cardiomegaly, I mean, you would see an enlarged heart shadow. So that's fine to say X ray appears cardiomegaly. Okay. So they are all fine, but it does not explain the. Bradycardia or bradycardia is but incompatible. Pulmonary embolism. Shortness of breath, yes. Pulmonary chest pain, true or false? Pulmonary embolism, pulmonary chest pain, I can pull one. True, sir. Oh, pulmonary embolism, pulmonary chest pain, I can pull one. But, but but the problem here is it's it's classically with more peripheral segmental subsegmental like pulmonary emboli okay causing peripheral segmental infarcts and therefore irritation and inflammation of the visceral pleura okay but you would not expect a subsegmental or a segmental embolus no, no, to give rise no, to heart, no. right heart failure and hypotension maybe incompatibility okay. you would see this hemodynamic instability and right heart failure in more major pulmonary artery occlusion okay right then again i would expect to see a tachycardia although pulmonary embolism can give rise to all sorts of arrhythmias Classically, it's a tachyarrhythmia than a bradyarrhythmia. Okay. And again, with pul acute pulmonary embolus, I would not expect to see a cardiomegaly. Maybe. So, all in all, congestive cardiac failure is clearly out by because of clear lungs and bradycardia. Mixedema is out, PSH is not high enough, but everything else is compatible. Right heart failure is out because of pleuritic chest pain and bradycardia. Cardiac tamponade is also out because of bradycardia and you could say pleuritic chest pain. Okay. Right. And pulmonary embolism is also out because pleuritic chest pain plus uh, right heart failure is rare to co occur. Okay, here the heck of a chance to go. So, if you have a comatic, unlikely to get paid, sorry. So, I don't know what the correct answer was, but my feeling is probably the TSH was wrong. Okay. I think TSH might have been higher. If that was the case, I would mark mixing it.
are there any other thoughts or do you know better does anyone know better about this question is there anything wrong in this question heard from seniors or anything like that <clears throat> For a moment, I also wondered if this narrow complex is we. I mean, I mean, yeah, it, it, it's sense. It's reasonable to say narrow complex bradycardia, yeah, but we generally talk about the width of the complexes with tachyarrhythmias. I was for a moment wondering because if this was low volume complexes and bradycardia, okay, which is in fact what I'm expecting. So essentially, cardiac tamponade is correct, but mixedema is a better answer because that also explains the bradycardia. Okay, so I probably think mixedema is the right answer. And I would increase the TSH to something like 100, or at least 60. Hi, any questions? Hello? No questions. We have about five minutes. Sapi, we see Hayat Kalanavatta Mirai. Then at 79-year-old man who was active and enjoyed walking presented with palpitations for one day. He has a history of several similar episodes in the past few weeks. Pulse was irregular, rate is 130, blood pressure is all right, clear lungs, normal heart sounds. It's a past history of hypertension and ischemic heart disease. ECG revealed atrial fibrillation, but no signs of ischemia. His chest x ray was also normal. What is the next best drug to be used in this patient? Amidarone, myobradic, digoxin, loyotacin, metaphorin. I then go make a newly diagnosed atrial fibrillation. When you first diagnose AF, the first question you ask is, is this patient in need of urgent cardioversion? In current monomanda, a hypotensive man, cardiogenic shock, a heart failure katina, that can sink up your katina, that the ischemia katina. He is not in shock, blood pressure is fine. He's not in heart failure, his lungs are clear. He doesn't seem to have syncope. He is seeing in an outpatient clinic. And he does not have any ischemia because there is no chest pain and the ECG doesn't show ischemic changes. So does he need cardioversion urgently? No. <clears throat> then the question is. How are we going to manage his atrial fibrillation? Is it rhythm control over rate control? And does he need anticoagulation? No. Rhythm control, the rate control, the killer decide karan, or will not feel any of the in the home. This is a little tricky because this is a rapidly evolving area. As far as I understand, current trend is that rhythm control does not give much of a benefit over rate control. Okay, therefore, tendency is to go more in line of rate control. Okay. 
perhaps if the patient is young and the heart is structurally fine, okay, and there is no apparent cause for atrial fibrillation, then one might think, okay, rather than leaving him in atrial fibrillation for the rest of his life, there is a decent chance of we successfully cardio verding or restoring sinus rhythm. Then one might think of doing with a control or cardio version, either electronically, electrically, or chemically with medicine. But at his age of 79 years, it's probably unlikely to be a successful thing or a sustainable venture. So probably the way forward is rate control. Okay. Then the question is, how are we going to control the rate? Unless contraindicated, first line is beta blockers. If beta blockers are not tolerated, then you can give a calcium channel blocker provided the patient is not in heart failure. If the patient is in heart failure and we can't use calcium channel blockers, then we will use digoxin. The mere asthma in a katawa kilane, lungs with clear, so we can use metoprolol for weight control. And we should try to aim at keeping the heart rate less than 100. At rest heart rate, exercise heart rate, they will take you away. It's a level up, but more recently, I think last year, there was a study telling that there is no point looking at rest and exercise separately. As long as your heart rate is less than 110 at rest, that's fine. Previous teaching was except a heart rate during mild moderate exertion less than 110 and heart rate at rest somewhere in 80s. But now the tendency is if your heart rate is under 110 at rest, that's fine. Right. So out of digoxin, delta C, metoprolol, the first choice will be metoprolol. What's the role of iobradine in the treatment of? Atrial fibrillation. Huh? Right. We... right. So, uh, how does iobradine act? It acts on the funny sodium channels in the pacemaker. Yes, very good. Where are those cells? Pacemaker says the end of the heart again. It's a very good thing. 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 It's a very good by the term rate control, we refer to controlling the pulse. So, in other words, it's the rate at which the ventricles control. Strictly speaking, that is the heart rate. Let's assume there is no pulse deficit. Okay, so we are essentially controlling the heart rate, and that is the rate of the ventricular contraction. And what is happening in atrial fibrillation? There are multiple foci of abnormal electrical activity in the atria. So there is a jumble of contractile responses in the atria, so much so that there is no effective contraction. It is like a bag of worms, it's just wriggling. Okay. So, uh, and there are so many action potentials that are generated in multiple sites in the atria and all of these will bombard the AV node. So AV node and his bundle is the only electrical connection between the atria and ventricles. 
Now, if the AV node and the bundle, his bundle, allowed all of these ventric uh, atrial electrical activities to go down into the ventricles, the ventricle will also start fibrillating. Fortunately, because uh, AV node has a maximum limit beyond which it will not transmit the impulses from atria to the ventricles. But sometimes it can still allow transmission of atrial uh, electrical activity at a high rate, like what the 150, 160. And that is what we are trying to correct. Now imagine if we go and block the SA node, will it have any effect on this conduction through the AV node and his bundle to the ventricles? Then, SA node is not active now. Its action is being surpassed or taken over by multiple abnormal electrical foci in the atria. Okay, so there is actually no point in blocking the SA node, and therefore there is no point in using a funny channel blocker like Ayurveda or an SA node blocker like Ayurveda. Instead, you should actually be blocking the AV node, and that is what metaprolol, diltiazem, and digoxin will do. Okay, in fact, in people without AF. Giving ivabradine and thereby suppressing a seno can cause atrial fibrillation. It makes sense, doesn't it? In disease hearts, there are always aberrant electrical activities, but they remain in check with the seno activity. Okay? So, if you block the seno activity, those foci can start firing. So I think about 8% of people started on iopredine can get atrial fibrillation. And iopredine is contraindicated in atrial fibrillation just because it will have no effect at all. As I said, no, this is any way inactive now. Understood, sir. Good. Hello, Make him a good Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. No problem. Good night. Thank you, sir. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.